Invest Africa, proudly brought to you by KPMG. And welcome. I'm Nozi Pombanjo, and this is Invest Africa. Now, tapping into the sweet tooth of the newly emerging African middle class was a great investment that saw billions of dollars flow into the continent's sugar industry. But as cheaper imports flood the market, causing a surplus of sugar that once sweet dream is quickly turning bad. But how does Africa compare in the global market? Let's take a look and see what the picture looks like. As we can see, the biggest sugar producer in the world is Brazil, uh, by no doubt. Obviously, seeing here the darkened uh, colors of uh, South, of South America, and in particular, highlighting the Brazilian market there. We can also see that in North America, they become close competitive. Comparing this, to, of course, to Africa, we see that the lightly shaded uh, markets in Africa show that our comparison globally is falling far behind the leaders in the pack, and in particular Brazil being that particular market. We see that Australia also is faring far higher than Africa. Let's turn our focus now to the regional picture and see what that looks like. As you can see here, we have uh, the darker yellow line which represents East Africa. And what we're seeing that as of 2008-2009, uh, roughly around the time of the global financial crisis, we did see a significant dip uh, in the sugar market. But this market is certainly taken off. This, of course, despite the fact that the biggest player in the market, that being Mumia Sugar, is right now in uh, a bit of trouble but no doubt that the broader market is certainly taken off and we're seeing that uh, record territory there being recorded in 2013. In contrast if we look at southern Africa we're seeing a significant di uh, dip this is from 2010 and then sort of a flat performance moving forward raising a lot of questions around uh, the dynamics and the trends that are in the southern African market that are different from what we're seeing in East Africa. And uh, here we're seeing uh, West Africa showing a flat performance across the board. This, of course, being despite the fact that uh, Dangote Sugar has just pledged about two billion US dollars into making that particular graph uh, look a little bit better. Let's take a look at the biggest players. Uh, that being said, Dangote Sugar, no doubt one of the biggest producers. We're seeing them there in 2014 but if we put this into perspective we see that Dangote Sugar and the Nigerian market is still a much smaller player of course than the East African and the Southern African market they are a big player in Nigeria but there are bigger markets and one of those markets of course is the Zambian sugar market what we're seeing here is that their 2012 record numbers have somehow uh, come down and we're seeing a flat performance between 2013 and 2014 but more or less a stable sugar industry in Zambia uh, turning our focus to uh, Ilova in uh, Malawi again a slight dip in 2014 from what they recorded in 2013 but the overall picture there also being of uh, stability. Mumias sugar, we're not too surprised when we see the, these uh, variations. Of course, Mumias uh, being one of those uh, big players in the market in Kenya, also coming through, being in a bit of corporate trouble. We see that they had hit a record at almost 200 uh, million tons of sugar um, in uh, 2012. That significant dip there in 2013 and a slight comeback that is being recorded. It will be interesting to see whether, uh, the, whether the, the company Mumias in particular is able to perform even better in 2015. Hippo Valley representing there the Zimbabwean market, uh, a fairly consistent performance there, a slight uptick in 2014 compared to what we saw in 2012 and 2013. And turning our focus now to Mauritius, which is a smaller player, but no doubt also pushing up their production numbers. The two big players there, ENL and Omni Kane, ENL, the smaller of the two, fairly consistent performance we're seeing there between 2012 and 2014. Omni Kane, though, making some significant progress in terms of ramping up their production numbers uh, significantly higher in 2014 as they were in 2013 and that's the picture that we have when we place the African market broadly against its global competitors but also when we take a more specific regional and uh, national look at the sugar sector but to maybe take us more in depth and give us more analysis I'm joined now in Lagos by Esile Igbe he's the director and head of West Africa research Esile thank you so so much for making the time to join us. Perhaps let's start off with you painting the broad picture for us. Describe to us the biggest trends and the dynamics that underpin the African sugar market at this moment. 
Well, I think that given the, uh, I mean, the status quo of uh, large deficit in, in sugar uh, production uh, across most African markets, uh, there's definitely, uh, I guess, a keen intention by you know all respected or sovereigns to to try and uh, you know address that. And so, you know, in different markets, you know, uh, uh, different agencies obviously representing uh, the government are working collaboratively with uh, key players to, to basically show our production of uh, sugar. Mm. Maybe let's take a regional approach and start off in West Africa, where we know that Dangote Sugar is probably one of the biggest players. To what extent do you think that uh, the, the market is competitive and that there are policies that are enabling this, or are we seeing a one-player dominance here? Well, Dangote Sugar is still very dominant, uh, as you pointed out, um, but uh, we have seen quite a number of uh, new players in the sector, uh, to the extent that Nigeria, Nigeria currently has uh, excess refining capacity uh, and to that extent we do believe that it gets more competitive. However, uh, there are new barriers of entry that have come in place as the government basically tries to, uh, to, uh, to shore up Nigeria's uh, local production of sugarcane and raw sugar. Uh, so to that extent, uh, a number of these companies will be required to invest billions of dollars uh, to backward integrate in their business uh, to, pro to produce local sugar, uh, which obviously will be used uh, in their local refineries. Mm. Looking at that uh, backward integration requirement, how would you describe the response uh, from the private sector, in particular coming from government, to ensure that they're investing in the local industry? I mean, from my point of view, I think it's been somewhat lukewarm, but I'm encouraged by the fact that uh, Dangote Sugar in particular has taken you know, uh, a very bold step in, in terms of obviously uh, uh, recruiting you know, required human resource uh, to help them uh, to, to actualize uh, this, uh, this dream. Uh, they're aiming for about 1.5 million equivalent uh, ref uh, refined sugar in Nigeria. To that extent, they're also you know, acquiring land as well to, uh, to, uh, um, to complement the roughly 35,000 hectares that they currently have. So um, I think it's still, you know, a long way uh, from sort of reaching uh, what they currently target. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think I'm encouraged by the fact that that process has already begun and they, are, they seem to be quite ahead of their peers. Yeah. And of course, there's that uh, two billion U.S. dollars that has been committed uh, by Dangote Sugar in six states uh, in Nigeria. Where do you see the industry going uh, for for Nigeria? Are we likely to see a lot of merger and, acquis and acquisitive um, uh, activity in this particular sector? I think it's likely. Um, I mean, you definitely have, you know, obviously some of the requisites already in play for, uh, for I guess, a situation like that. Uh, but I think that it hasn't necessarily translated into that yet because, uh, like I said, you know, the private sector interest hasn't really gained the kind of momentum that it should. And the reason for that drawback is because I believe the private sector still wants some sort of, uh, they, still, they still want a lot more incentivization from the government mm -hmm. uh, to really embark on this kind of projects. Bear in mind that, you know, for 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 sugar pro uh, production or cultivating sugar cane, it's still a uh, you know it's, it's still a very uh, uh, should I say uh, young industry in Nigeria for something that started in the around 1960s. Mm. Nigeria has got very limited experience in the cultivation of sugar cane, and so uh, the private sector is obviously very conscious of the significant risk they'll have to undertake. You know obviously cultivating several thousands, uh, hundred thousands of hectares uh, to, to produce the, the level of sugar that is required to cover Nigeria's local domestic consumption. Right. Esile, let's go to the east of the continent, in particular looking at uh, the Kenyan market, uh, where Mumia's sugar has perhaps been the dominant player there. But it seems as if uh, dumping uh, coming through uh, from Brazil uh, and, and other markets is really seeming to threaten the viability of the sugar sector in, in East Africa and Kenya in particular. Just give us some insight in terms of uh, the dynamics dynamics in those particular markets? Well, the, the Kenyan market, I think in particular, is uh, basically suffered from, uh, I guess, the fact that you do have quite a number of international players who, who, who bring sugar into the market, uh, a, a lot of them particularly from Northern Africa, and you do have some also coming directly from Brazil. Uh, 
but um, I do believe that there are also, you know, uh, uh, protocols within, you know, the, the the trade union that they belong to. Uh, this is the EAC that require them to to probably delay, you know, the timing uh, of uh, of basically liberalizing uh, the trading of sugar within the region. Mm -hmm. And this also, you know, uh, this also uh, is uh, uh, this also speaks to the, the wider sort of East African, Southern, and probably North African markets as well. Mm. Let's bring Egypt into the, into the equation. I mean, I, I, I recall a few months ago, a few weeks ago, uh, that uh, Egypt was accused of being a throughway through which uh, Brazil can come in and then proceed to dump uh, sugar in the East African market. To what extent is politics a big player in the development of the sugar uh, industry in Africa? And in particular, the question is, is politics holding back uh, the development of the sector because private sector is not going to want to get involved where there's just too much politicization of a specific commodity. Well, I think to be honest with you, uh, sugar is polit uh, politicized uh, globally. I mean, so if you look at the EU, the US, India, Brazil, you know, uh, sugar markets are highly regulated. So uh, I don't think there's uh, anything you can, uh, you can do to really I guess mitigate you know that risk. I think what is very essential, though, is that you know the government provides the necessary uh, incentives and operating environment for the private sector to obviously make uh, decent economic profits, uh, 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 despite maybe some of the harsh or negative uh, uh, regulatory uh, headwinds. Uh, but I do believe that uh, Africa is definitely heading towards. Uh, 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 that objective, even in Kenya, where you know Muma Sugar, the, the dominant player there, has a pretty robust you know scheme and program for you know obviously increasing its own internal production of sugar cane, but also uh, uh, you know complementary production from from our growers. Uh, uh, so in in the case of Nigeria, I think that we're significantly behind that. In that, mm. we still produce roughly about 50, uh, 50 thousand equivalent tons of, of refined sugar and so there's a lot of work you know get into uh, current consumption of roughly 1.5 million and you know that is where government policy uh, uh, obviously comes in uh, the government in Nigeria recently introduced uh, a, a national sugar master plan which I believe he followed to the letter will uh, at some stage ensure guarantee Nigeria's self-sufficiency self in the production of sugar uh, I mean, clearly looking at where the implementation of that master plan is today, mm. uh, I mean, I think that there is, that there, that there does appear to be some cracks. And I think that that is clearly uh, as a result of, uh, you know, how they've implemented it so far, how effective the implementation of, of that policy so far. So just to be clear to your point, you can't really avoid the, politi uh, the politicization of, of, uh, of the sugar market across Africa. It's something that's done globally. Uh, what needs to be done is provide the, the right incentives and the, 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 the suitable, suitable environment to allow mm. you know, private sector players operate. It certainly sounds like it's a question of incentives and a question of a, a conducive policy environment. Let's take a short break on that note, but when we come back, let's continue our conversation looking at the sugar industry in Africa. <music> Welcome back to Invest Africa. Tonight we're talking about the African sugar market. Remember that you can be a part of these conversations. You can tweet us, that's at CNBC Africa with the hashtag Invest Africa. Still with me is Asila Igbe, he's a director and head of West Africa Research. Asila, thank you so much for making uh, the time to join us uh, once again. Uh, let's talk about the demand side of this equation. I think to a large extent we've been looking at the developments of the sugar market in Africa, but with European markets, uh, reviewing some of the agreements that they have uh, with uh, with the certain African markets and the sugar industry obviously being impacted how do we generate sufficient demand internally in the African continent to make up for whatever shortfall may result from that well I'm not sure I got your question correctly but uh, 
if I understood what you're trying to say, you're asking how the demand side of the sort of the uh, the sugar industry basically develops. Uh, and I think, to be honest with you, you know, Africa as a whole is still very, very, uh, very low con uh, consumer of sugar. And I, I, I want to be precise uh, around uh, sort of so sub-Saharan Africa. I mean, in North Africa, they tend to have relatively higher penetration because of cultural reasons. I mean, it's it's normal for you to see an average of about 40, uh, uh, 40 uh, uh, kilograms per, um, uh, sorry, 40 grams, sorry, 40 grams per person annually. You know, and you compare that to uh, Nigeria, for example, where it's currently about uh, roughly eight, eight kilograms uh, uh, per, per year. Uh, uh, so um, I do believe that in, in sub-Saharan Africa, there's clearly a lot of upside to, uh, to growth in the demand side. Uh, it's now only a question of affordability mm. and availability. Very important, uh, I think, factors for, for driving growth. Mm. And to give you a very good example, Nigeria is one market where there clearly is a significant potential in that you have some of the very positive uh, or favorable demographics. Uh, you also have you know, quite uh, a, a very strong uh, e sort of evolving uh, trend from uh, sort of the urbanization of the population and sort of the kind of cultural uh, positive cultural change that are happening there to incentivize the uh, the growth of of, uh, of sugar consumption, uh, but that has been limited, almost truncated by the pricing of of sugar. You know, in Nigeria, it's uh, at some stage, you know, sugar prices went as high as uh, roughly about seventy dollars uh, for about a fifty kg of bag. You know, you compare that to you know, uh, some other markets or regulated markets in Africa mm. uh, where it was sourced for, for more cheaper, about uh, $50, less than $50 right. uh, for, for a 50 kg bag. And I think what you've done is address the first part of my question and then maybe give me an opportunity to rephrase to get the emphasis from the second part, which is really the kind of uh, threat that uh, the, the European trade uh, agreements that exist between European markets and African markets that have enabled uh, African players to supply into Europe and these being in question, whether this in addition uh, to low penetration in the African uh, context has now led to an, a situation where the, the incentive uh, for the private sector to invest in the in the sugar sector is even more diminished. Well, not necessarily. Uh, well, for, for for one thing, I'm sure that 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 pact is almost nearing nearing an end. I believe it's probably this year or next year. I'm not very sure now, but it's also limited. If I recall, the number is about 300,000 uh, 300, tons. Now, the total deficit in Sub-Saharan Africa is in excess of uh, four four million tons. So uh, that doesn't really cut it. And don't forget again that you know, the, uh, the, 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 there are only a, a specific number of African countries that are allowed uh, to import sugar into the European Union. So it's not just across the board. So Nigeria, for example, wouldn't qualify as an exporter into uh, the European Union. Mm -hmm. You spoke about prices a little bit earlier and how we've seen significant changes in the Nigerian context. But overall, we can talk about a volatility of uh, the sugar price. Let's get your sense in terms of the outlook uh, for the price of this commodity moving forward. Uh, do you see the volatility uh, you know, settling and, uh, and do you see the price also settling at, at, at a peg that might actually be a key driver for investors to step in? Um, well, I think that that would definitely happen as the market naturally becomes more competitive it brings in you know it it, it does force some pressure or places pressure on, on prices and that would naturally incentivize uh, uh, consumption uh, that you also have the, the sugar available as well is also a very big incentive and a good example is brazil the world's largest uh, producer of sugar they currently produce in excess or consume in excess of about uh, 70 uh, kg per person so uh, I do believe that as you know, government programs incentivize uh, the uh, local production of sugar cane, ultimately sugar, mm. uh, and you know the market becomes more competitive, driving down prices. Uh, we should see uh, an acceleration in in the consumption of sugar in in Nigeria, mm. and I think Ghana is a very good example uh, where we've, we've we've continued to see growth in sugar consumption. Uh, despite uh, a substantial slowdown in Nigeria's growth over the last couple of years. And, if, and even just going back to highlight how prices do impact consumption, uh, Nigeria's growth in, in sugar consumption did stall, as I pointed out, 
from roughly around 2009 or 2008 to probably 2012. But over the last two years, three years to a year, we've seen a pickup again in consumption because sugar prices have have contracted sharply. Mm. We've been to a large extent in this conversation, uh, limited our conversation to the big players uh, in the markets from your Dangote Sugars to Ilovo, Mumias and, and the like. What about the smallholder farmer uh, in Nigeria? Are they getting sufficient attention to see how they can become meaningful players in the sugar value chain? Well, the market is just being organized. Um, so you, I think we must give credit to the government for that. Um, prior to about a few years ago. I mean, there really wasn't a, a proper structure around how you organize, you know, uh, you know, uh, farmers around obviously cultivating probably any crop at all. So you have, a, I think, a very aggressive uh, agricultural minister in Nigeria that has obviously pushed, pushed for that. I think one of the biggest moves he made was to de deregulate uh, the fertilizer industry or the supply of fertilizer. And, you know, that itself is basically ushered in the a massive agricultural revolution in, in the country. But speak, speaking specifically about sugarcane, uh, it, it, it basically started out with the, the sugar producers themselves. Mm. Uh, first, the, the government introduces a plan. Part of that plan requires that there will be a phased increase in import tariffs, discouraging the importation of sugar over time uh, in favor of local sourcing of, of, uh, of, of sugar. In addition to that, uh, there are also quotas. There's a quota-based system where you're only given you know, quota to import uh, a raw sugar to refine locally based on the amount of commitment you've made to, uh, to, to, to cultivating local uh, sugar cane locally. So I think a combination of all those factors will be the big incentive to mm -hmm. first having the companies have you know, a decent amount of local production and then afterwards building a very strong uh, Algora support base mm. and, that, and that is when the, the basic farmer comes in. I think uh, Isli, there's also been very interesting developments in Africa where it, it almost seems as if the agricultural minister and the minister of health go head to head when it comes to this uh, issue of sugar in particular where there's a growing narrative that uh, sugar is unhealthy and that the population needs to uh, focus on healthier lifestyles. To what extent are we seeing that battle playing itself out in Nigeria? Um, Nigeria consuming about 8 kg of sugar uh, per, per capita is very low. So I don't believe that those are levels that are threatening uh, to, to one's health. Um, you know, I did point out Brazil at over about 70 kg per, per capita as being at, at the relatively high side, you know, from a global perspective. So I'm not sure that that is the worry at the moment. You know, I think, like I said, what is very important is having the right policies in place to ensure that uh, you first of all have sufficient local production and just maybe afterwards you can now start having policies that could probably divert mm. some of that production to probably uh, you know um, uh, 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 efficient uh, energy use like you know mm. uh, a biofuel like ethanol as you know I think Brazil has been very successful with. Mm. Let's, let's latch on to that uh, last point because what we find in the South African context is that there, there's been uh, quite the spotlight that's been shifted to sugar producers, especially in uh, response to how uh, they can play a role in, 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 in solving the energy crisis that South Africa finds itself in. No doubt maybe something that's not as relevant in Nigeria as yet, but the power crisis is just as important uh, and significant in Nigeria. Uh, would the sugar sector be at all one of the options that you think might uh, come up with a viable way of uh, supporting the grid? Well, I think that that is partly what this national master plan in Nigeria seeks to address. Uh, but bear in mind that, you know, obviously the primary objective is to uh, produce refined sugar for, for local consumption. Um, and then I think that after that, you can now begin to speak of, you know, its use in the production of uh, ethanol or, you know, the, or diverting sort of the, the waste, you know, like, uh, like, by, uh, like uh, by gas, you know, into the, the production of, uh, of energy. Uh, as I did point out, you know, um, Brazil has been relatively successful in that front. And I believe that you know other markets will definitely uh, piggyback on on that. I think Kenya has also had you know uh, a, a certain level of trials, uh, but hasn't been very successful because you know the the core driver, the Mumias itself, has hasn't been relatively stable. 
Uh, but I think that um, there is, I think, enough evidence uh, to, uh, to, to, I guess, uh, uh, promote uh, a similar policies in a number of cross markets, not just in Nigeria, but across Africa, where you know, power is essential and at this stage a deficit. And also more important, uh, uh, you know, the cost of fuel. Mm. Isile, thank you so much uh, for making the time to join us, walking us through the, the dynamics of uh, the sugar industry in Africa. That's all we have time for. A very big thank you to Esile Egbe. He is the director and head of West Africa Research. Please remember that you can send us your comments. The details are on the screen. We do want to hear from you and what you'd like to see on the show. From myself and the Invest Africa team, it's goodbye.